HBO live from London. Heavyweight contenders Razor Ruddock of Canada and Lennox Lewis of England. The winner to meet the winner of the bout between Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bowe for the title. Ruddock versus Lewis next live on HBO. Boxing means champions. Boxing means tradition. Boxing means HBO. Live from London, the heavyweight title eliminator. Number one contender, Razor Ruddock. Can he cut down number two, Lennox Lewis, for the right to face the world champ? Plus, Taylor versus Espana in a world championship boxing doubleheader. You know where it happened. Taylor versus Espana and Ruddock versus Lewis. Coming up next on HBO. Special presentation of HBO Sports. Tales from the ring. Eeny, screamy, slimy mo. Who fights the winner of Holyfield? Bo? Will it be Lennox Lewis or will it be Razor Ruddick? We find out tonight in a glorious new episode of Tales from the Ring. Now that Ruddick the Razor is a sharp fellow, number one on the WBC most wanted list. His punches made pudding out of dynamite dough, and his books made mush out of bone precious mint. He sliced and diced and almost toppled Tyson twice. seems to have quite the edge. But don't discount Lennox Lewis. He's boned a few skills of his own and can turn anybody's fight night into fright night. <laughs> Talk about mad dogs and Englishmen. This Lewis has both. He's whacked and wobbled Weaver. Smashed and buried beef. And during the 88 Olympics, he even bent a bitter bow. No doubt about it. I'd keep Ruddick all tied up. <laughs> and if I was Ruddick, I'd use my hook. <laughs> no pain, no gory. That's what I always say. But since no one seems very interested in the Crypt Keeper's fighting tips, let's get it on and see who gets the trick and who gets the treat and for whom the skull told. <laughs> Ready, kiddies, for the WBC heavyweight title elimination fight between number one ranked Razor Ruddick and the number two contender, Lennox Lewis. A Halloween thriller go-go right here in HBO. <laughs> capital of the culture where organized boxing was invented, but where no native son has held the sport's most prestigious title for nearly 100 years. We bring you a fight which will be instrumental in the heavyweight championship picture. We are live from Earl's Court in London, England, where HBO Sports presents a boxing doubleheader. First, the WBC heavyweight title elimination between the number one contender, Razor Ruddock, and the number two contender, Lennox Lewis, the winner guaranteed by contract to face the victor in the November 13 showdown between Holyfield and Bo. And then WBA welterweight champion, Meldrick Taylor, defending his title against top-ranked, unbeaten contender, Crisanto Espana. Both fights are scheduled for 12 rounds. And hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to an evening on HBO's World Championship Boxing in which we have a full bag of treats for you. As I mentioned, 
Meldrick Taylor defending his WBA World Welterweight Championship against Crisanto Espana of Venezuela. That fight took place earlier, has been recorded, and we will bring it to you later on after the Lewis Ruddock fight. Also, during the course of our live broadcast this evening, you'll have a chance to offer your vote on who you believe will win the upcoming heavyweight championship fight between champion Evander Holyfield and challenger Riddick Bowe. If you believe the champion will retain his title, give a call to 1-900-246-HOLY, H-O-L-Y, and cast your vote. If you believe that the challenger will beat Holyfield, then call 1-900-246-BOW. Each call costing 65 cents, the collected proceeds from the evening's poll, to go to the Mark Edis Foundation for the benefit of disadvantaged former fighters. If you're in a West Coast time zone, incidentally, we caution you, don't bother to call in on the Holyfield Bow poll, because there in the West, this fight is being seen tape delayed rather than live, and therefore your vote wouldn't count. Now, on to the business at hand. The title eliminator between Lennox Lewis of England and Razor Ruddock of Canada. It's my own personal judgment that never in the history of the sport have two 230-pound athletes with the natural gifts of Lewis and Bo, or Lewis and Ruddock, I should say, gotten into the ring against each other. Bo becomes a part of the picture somewhere down the road if he's able to beat Holyfield. For more on that and watching the fights with us, HBO boxing analyst Larry Merchant. Larry, two big men, a very big night. That's right. Big men, big states, that means big stuff. And what truly makes it big is the big picture. This is the first of three fights that will either validate Evander Holyfield as a heavyweight champion or give us a new heavyweight champion. What also makes this big is the willingness of Lewis and Ruddick to fight each other rather than duck each other and merely wait for a guaranteed shot at the title for bigger money than they're going to make tonight. That says something about them. As a business proposition, this fight, well, it's like a polar bear needing snowshoes. It doesn't make any sense. Finally, what makes this fight big is the probability that the winner tonight will be favored to be the winner of Holyfield versus Bo. Big stuff, Jim. Great point about the two polar bears with <laughs> snowshoes, Lennox Lewis and Razor Ruddock. For once, it is not all about business. This fight, at least as much, about honor and pride and all the fundamental things that can make boxing so exciting. And here with us, one of the most exciting heavyweight champions of all time, still a heavyweight contender, George Foreman. George, in addition to the title implications and some personality conflicts we'll talk about later on, you have the classic style confrontation, the overwhelming puncher in Ruddock against Lewis, who is more of a boxer. Now, on form, we would expect you to favor the puncher. Do you? Ordinarily, I would, but this time, I believe if Lewis is able to contain himself and his corner tell him to fight three minutes only every round, most heavyweights throw it away in four or five minutes per round, then they're tired, and vultures, vultures like Rudder, they hoover in and then say, I got you. But he'll be hovering and waiting for something to die. He's not your devastating predator. He waits for it to unfold itself. If it doesn't unfold, he'll wait for 12 rounds, as he did with Mike Tyson. In which case, Lewis can win a decision. In Lewis your... can easily win a decision. He's got the bigger and longer left jab. He's got the enthusiasm, and he can win this thing. So George Foreman picks an upset. That is a source of great excitement to English boxing fans who pin their hopes on Lennox Lewis to erase nearly 100 years of heavyweight frustration. Lewis comes, as you'll see now, from a boxing culture entirely different than our own. <laughs> The city, understated London, is about as different as you can get from the brash American boxing meccas of Las Vegas, Reno, and Atlantic City. And having lived in both England and in North America, British boxing champion Lennox Lewis knows this better than most. He knows also that the boxing in Britain is different as well. You have a lot of TV networks and they're at competitions. Over here you just have a couple of TV networks and uh, I think the money's more greater over there because of pay-per-view. The absence of major television money has made it unattractive for big-name fighters, even British ones like Lewis, to fight in England. If we could, if I could say I want X to fight Y, we've got thousands to pay for it, it would happen and it would be good for the game. 
but money dictates again and we can't often afford to put the shows on that we want. British promoters also lack access to a second source of revenue available to Americans. You guys, if you want a big fight, you go to uh, Atlantic City, uh, Reno or Vegas, okay? You get paid to have the fight. Over here, if you take Lewis Roddick as an example, the guys have had to pay Earl's Court to stage the fight. Casinos in America pay promoters for the right to stage fights, hoping to make a profit by selling tickets, and even more importantly, from the gambling money that the boxing fans spend on their casino floors. The absence of major fights in England is one factor leading to a recent drop-off in the number of British boxers, which in turn has caused a general decline in the quality of fighters here. I find that uh, training in America it's easier for me to have um, sparring partners instead of calling for sparring partners in England. And you're finding now that a lot of top boxers in England will go to America to train. Lennox Lewis cites the example that if one of his sparring partners was injured when he was training in England, he'd have to fly a guy in. Not wanting to take that risk, Lewis chose to train in America for this fight, returning to England just days before the match. basic difference is that although you have state control in the United States where there are state commissions and they are statutory commissions, we have a non-statutory body, the British Boxing Board of Control, but it basically controls the whole of professional boxing in the British Isles. For this local fight in Liverpool, for example, there was no mishmash of state commissions all using different rules. In Britain, boxing is regulated by one central board. Surprisingly though, the British do allow promoters to manage their fighters, a practice we in the United States regard as a conflict of interest. I manage most of the boxes that I use, and I make no secret of it. The difference is that I'm out in the open, and whatever I'm doing, I have to be seen to be doing the right thing, because I'm the official manager. The question, of course, is this. If a promoter pits two of his fighters against each other, which one does he represent? It's a problem, but the British argue that in fact the same system is in place in the United States with the Dubas and the Kings, father-son promoter-manager arrangements. The difference is whether you want to partake in window dressing or not. TV interviews in the ring after fights are prohibited in England now. The direct result of British boxer Michael Watson having fallen into a coma last year in a ring so crowded with media that at first no one noticed. The doctor has to look at the winner and the loser directly after the contest before any interview can take place and now it has to be perhaps given at ringside if the box is in decent condition. It's not going to make much difference to Lennox Lewis where he talks to media after he fights Razor Ruddock as long as they're talking to the winner. We bring you back to ringside in Earl's Court, London, England, where in a matter of minutes now, Canadian Razor Ruddock faces Englishman Lennox Lewis in a heavyweight championship elimination bout. The winner to earn the right to fight the winner of Holyfield Bow for the crown. And for more on this exciting night of boxing in London, we turn you over once again to HBO boxing analyst Larry Merchant. Let me introduce you to the heavyweight champion exactly 200 years ago, Daniel Mendoza, known throughout the kingdom as Mendoza the Jew. In those days, prize fighting was a marathon contest of you hit me and I'll hit you and we'll see which one of us survives. Mendoza revolutionized it by introducing boxing to prize fighting. And that brings us to Lennox Lewis and British heavyweights. Over this century, they've earned the reputation as horizontal heavyweights, or you hit me and I'll fall down heavyweights. Lennox Lewis has had the advantage of having grown up and spent half of his life in Canada and trained much of the time in North America. He is made of sterner stuff. He does fight as a boxer, but he can punch and he shows flashes of aggress aggressiveness. He may be the real thing, a real fighter and better than that. Razor Ruddock will bring out the best in him or the worst in him. 
especially if, especially if he's the improved Razor Ruddock he claims to be. Going into a major fight like against Tyson, it's necessary for the trainers to be able to relate to the fighter, for the fighter to have confidence in the trainers in order to um, formulate a fighting plan, a battle plan. If he goes off course, what is his fighting plan, the trainers are there to say, wait, listen, stick to your plan and execute it this way because it will work. And that was not there in the two Tyson fights. Perhaps it was a lack of big fight experience. Perhaps a case of too many cooks in the kitchen, too many trainers in the corner. The fact remains, Donovan Razor Ruddock lost two very important fights against Iron Mike Tyson. I don't think it was a lot. I did the best I can. I, did, I came out on the bottom. You, there's no way you can beat me. There's no way. Because even when I'm, I, I, they think I lost. I feel that I don't lose. I didn't lose. And as long as I feel inside that I never, I never lost, I feel good about myself, and I go back in there just as strong as I did before. Both fights against Tyson offered important lessons for Ruddock. They helped to enhance his reputation and his career, earning him respect for his efforts. And they proved to Team Ruddock that it needed to make changes if it wanted to move forward in its quest for a title shot. That decision boiled down to one thing, the need for a new trainer. If you look at the two Tyson fights, there was a lot of chaos in the corner. We had a lot of problems. And, um, I didn't have no help. I didn't have no one to turn to in, the, in, in there. We definitely need someone with experience who's been there before. So one night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I had this intuition. I woke up. I said, I got it. I got it. Floyd Patterson. That's the man that can train Razor Ruddy. Floyd Patterson, Olympic gold medalist, trained by the legendary Custom Auto, went on to become the first ever two-time world heavyweight champion. Having trained mostly amateur boxers since the early 1970s, Floyd was impressed with the power and the potential of Razor Ruddock. And I'm finding out that Razor has a tremendous amount of uh, ability because he picks up just like that when he wants to. When you've done something for a number of years, all of a sudden you're told to do it another way, uh, it's very, very hard. It confuses you, and that's the one thing I didn't want to do. So I did, I did very slowly. With Patterson in his corner, Ruddock has added two more victories to his record. But it may take some time before he irons out all the bad habits he developed. We're trying to put the right hand together. We're working on a lot of little things that will make me a little bit smoother in the ring. Every time he throws the right hand, he tightens the right hand up because he wants to throw it as hard as he can, so he tightens up. And the moment he tightens up, he pulls back. When you pull back, you're now telegraphed. You've just told your opponent you're going to throw a right hand. The way to throw a right hand, you have to be exceptionally limber. You throw it as fast as you possibly can and very loose. The shoulder actually throws the punch. Donovan Razor Ruddock not only listens, but respects the teachings of Floyd Patterson. The fact that Patterson won the title not once but twice gives Razor renewed faith that Patterson can lead him down that same road. And the win against Lennox Lewis ostensibly secures a title shot against the winner of Holyfield Bow. For the first time in the history of boxing, there will be a former two-time heavyweight champion who will be the trainer of the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And that's Donovan Razor Ruddy. And that's just my humble opinion. Coincidence number one among many. Razor Ruddock isn't the only fighter in the ring tonight with a new trainer. Since his last appearance on HBO, a disappointing 10-round decision over Levi Billups in Las Vegas, Lennox Lewis fired former trainer John Davenport and has hired Pepe Correa, the man who in the late stages of Sugar Ray Leonard's career was Leonard's trainer. Yes, and he is trying to imbue the habits of Leonard of being patient, taking his shot when it's there, not rushing things. From the noise of this crowd, they may be starting to accept Lennox Lewis in Britain. So far, they really don't see him 
as British since he won the Olympics under the Canadian flag. But if he wins tonight, he'll be more British than the Queen. Born in London, reared in Jamaica and in Canada, won the 1988 Olympic gold medal for Canada, knocking out Riddick Bowe in the final. Now a professional from England, Lennox Lewis, and the ring record for this man who now enters the ring to the standing ovation of English boxing fans. 21 consecutive wins for Lewis, 18 knockouts against, every expert would say, at best, indifferent opposition. In part because good opposition didn't want to get in the ring with him at this stage of his career. And now you hear the booing beginning to fester on the other side of the arena as Razor Ruddock makes his entrance into the ring. Razor Ruddock, who years ago in Toronto, Ontario, had an amateur fight against Lennox Lewis when Lewis was 15 years old, a 3-2 decision for Ruddock at that time. Later, when Lewis was still an amateur and Ruddock had turned pro, they sparred with each other. In the words of Lewis, they sparred countless rounds together. But as Lewis points out, Ruddock wasn't a slugger then. He was a boxer. Ruddock is seen to have the advantage of a puncher and someone who's been in with tough opposition and having been hit hard and come back from being hit hard. But I think you have to suspect somebody whose credibility is based on losing twice to Mike Tyson. 19 rounds with Tyson. He was knocked down four times. He won three of the 19 rounds, and yet off of that, many observers call him the best heavyweight in the division, the uncrowned champion. Tale of the tape for Lennox Lewis and Razor Ruddock. And you see the weights, 231 and a half for Ruddock, 227 and a half for Lewis. Not the roly-poly heavyweights of years past, two sculpted Adonises. Punch stat numbers, Larry Merchant. Well, from these numbers, you can see where many people are backing Lewis, the underdog, because he throws so many more punches that Ruddick, at least the Ruddick we're used to, who was a, basically a one-handed fighter, that big left. And Lewis's advantage is pronounced with the jab. He has to win with the jab. Ruddick has used it sparingly, although he is said to have had a very good one before he turned out to be a slugger. Now for the rules of tonight's Lewis Ruddock bout, we go to our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. Razor Ruddock and Lennox Lewis will fight tonight using the rules of the World Boxing Council. 12 rounds, three judges scoring the fight, 10-point must system, there is no standing gate count, no three knockdown rule. He can be saved by the bell in the last round only. Jim. The electric environment in Earl's Court. We go to ring announcer Mike Goodall for the national anthems and the pre-fight introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please be upstanding for both national anthems.
through sport throughout Canada and the United States of America to Earl's Court Arena in the heart of London Town in England. This is the main event of the evening, sponsored by Nightstick. Craig Maloney for Championship Enterprises and the main events in association with Murad Mohammed, 3M Promotions Incorporated, presents the fight for the right. A contest of 12 three-minute rounds, the WBC final eliminator for the heavyweight championship of the world. And to decide the heavyweight championship of the Commonwealth. The officials appointed for this contest by the WBC, the supervisor in charge, Mr. Jose Sullivan, president of the WBC, the British Boxing Board of Control steward in charge, Mr. Nipper Reed, the timekeeper this evening, Mr. Tommy Rice of London, the judges are Mr. Chuck Hazard of Anaheim, California, Mr. Franz Marty of Ockringham, Switzerland and Mr. Tom Kazmarek of Brick, New Jersey. The referee in charge of the action this evening, Mr. Joe Cortez of the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing in the red corner, his record reads 27 wins, three losses, one draw, 20 wins by KO from Toronto, Canada, the number one ranked by the WBC, Donovan Areza Rudder. And in the blue corner, we're in the red trunks from East London, England. seven and a half pounds Lewis 227 and a half pounds 16 stone three and a half pounds ladies and gentlemen I thank you issue when a fighter fights his first major fight and if they got the right stuff they come through it if he can take a punch we may have something special here I'll look for Lennox Lewis to follow the instruction now try to get as many jabs into the chest of Roddick take away that power because Roddick is not interested in nothing until the last round not since the days of Bob Fitzsimmons in the last decade of the 19th century as an English-born fighter held the heavyweight crown. Is Lennox Lewis about to take a step toward wiping out that century of frustration? Or is Razor Ruddock indeed the uncrowned champion of the sport? We are about to find out. Even though it has been years since they've been in the ring together. I get the feeling that Ruddick is a bit overexcited, George. Yeah, he's trying to be an aggressor, and he's not an aggressor. And at the same time, he wants to fulfill Floyd Patterson's dream of being a good boxer. This could be one of the most confused fighters tonight. Which punch will dominate the bout? Will it be Lewis's jab, which you've seen there? initiates the action so far. He says his plan is to stick the jab, stay relaxed, move away from the left hook, and out 
Bach Threader. Oh, it's Lord Patterson has been telling Rudder, jab to the body so you can get the right hand in. Good left hook to the body, of course. Rudder did not remember to go to the body much against Mike Tyson in those two fights. He has begun with at least one body shot here. Both fighters using the jab to begin. There's the left hook, reaching and flailing by Rudder. Short left that hook. That left hook hurt. He didn't intend for it to hurt because he caught him off guard, but it, believe me, Lewis is hurt at this moment. Two minutes into round one. Lewis sticking the jab. Ruddock shows the left hook but doesn't bring it. Among Ruddock's many technical shortcomings in recent fights is the tendency to telegraph all of his punches. Good left jab. If Lewis can continue to establish his dominant jab to make us an easy fight, if he backs away, he's going to just fall victim to a wild left hook. And Ruddock, who claimed that he would box, began with the jab, but in the last 30 seconds has been flailing with the left hook as always. That doesn't mean it's ineffective. He has so much power behind him. Ruddick was hurt, came out in the second round, 
trying to look like he could still fight, plainly had nothing left. And here is the end of the fight. Ruddick manfully trying to land something to get Lewis off him, but he can't. Oh, look at that right hand. No doubt about it, a clean knockout. Referee Joe Cortez didn't even bother to finish the count. Here in London, it's one o'clock, and, uh, and would you believe the Sunday punch? One o'clock in the morning, Sunday in London, belonged to Lennox Lewis, not Razor Ruddick. And dawn may be breaking at the end of a dark century for British heavyweights. Lennox Lewis of London is headed uptown. Well, he just became the most British Britisher in the British Isles. That's right. <laughs> He's no Canadian here anymore. You wonder how that man knocked out Riddick Bowe to win an Olympic gold medal? That's how he did it. Now, normally at this point, you would see Larry Merchant going into the ring to interview the two fighters. But the British Board of Boxing Control mandates that both fighters must be examined by doctors in the ring prior to any interview. So Larry will wait here at ringside with us. And Lewis comes to our side of the ring to wave to the crowd and say, I'm ready. Lennox. I'm right here. Right, right here. I told you he could. Right. And Lewis gets the approval of George Foreman at close range. There's tremendous excitement in the ring. The British did not expect a full house in there as they've got right now. Lewis steps down. He is incredibly calm, George. If there was one thing we took away from our meetings with the two fighters yesterday, it was that Lewis was either faking it or was as calm before a big fight as any fighter you've ever seen. It was seen. the right way to be. He passed every test in my eyes. I thought maybe the fight would go longer and he would win, but I never expected a dynamite left hook like that. Most people thought that the question was whether Ruddock would knock out Lewis, whether Lewis could survive Ruddock's punch. It turns out that the answer was that Ruddock couldn't take Lewis's punch. Ruddock, fine fighter, but he underestimated this kid. Well, he didn't show technique. He said he came into the ring to box. One minute into the fight, he was flailing with the left hook again, leaving himself wide open. Too confused, too confused. And we remind you, our ongoing phone poll on the Holyfield Bow fight. You call right now, because the poll is going to be closing rather quickly this evening, not like election day on Tuesday. If you believe that Holyfield will retain his title on November 13, give a call to 1-900-246-HOLY, H-O-L-Y. Or if you believe Bo is going to take the title from Holyfield, call 1-900-246-BO. As soon as we've tabulated the results, not too terribly long from now, we'll be talking live in Houston to Evander Holyfield, who has just watched Lennox Lewis's quick destruction of Ray Zaretic right now. Let's go to ring announcer Mike Goodall, somewhere in the melee in there, for the official decision. 46 seconds of round two. The winner on a knockout, Lennox Lewis! So the man who lasted through almost 19 full rounds with Mike Tyson lasts three minutes, 46 seconds against the heretofore largely unheralded contender, Lennox Lewis. I expected as much. <laughs> yeah, you did. You predicted that Lewis would win the fight, and you have been adamant about it all week, George. I've got to give you credit. George never backed down in the face of writers who said, oh, he's crazy. Ruddock has to win this fight by knockout. I thought he'd win the fight, too, but I thought he'd win by a decision. I did not expect that he was going to annihilate Razor Ruddock. With I thought after the first knockdown, Ruddock would continue to brawl a little bit, but have that respect to enable Lewis to win a decision. I never expected him to try to clean house. Well, Harold, how'd you score it? 
<laughs> Boy, Jim, I'll tell you, I'm the most amazed man in the place. There's no question that I thought Razor Ruddick was going to yeah, win the Yeah, you're the one in our group who's Absolutely. been picking Ruddick. I, I went with experience all the way. Lennox Lewis certainly surprised me. So Tremendous his... right hand. He did measure him like he said he was going to do in a meeting with us. And boy, he tagged him with that right hand after he measured him with the left. Well, he delivers the right hand very quickly, doesn't he? Exactly. He measures you with the left, takes you with the overhand right. The so, thing with Ronick is a lot of confusion. He's a puncher. Everybody's calling him a puncher, so he's expected to attack this young boy. And at the same time, Patterson is teaching him to box. How can you get in the ring with such confusion? Well, and let's face it, George, Ruddock has been living on the mystique of Mike Tyson. Everybody thought Ruddock was so good, or at least those who thought he was going to win this fight, because they thought Tyson was so good. But the Tyson who beat Ruddock was not the Tyson of earlier in his career. And right now, Larry Merchant stands by with the triumphant 27-year-old Lennox Lewis. Larry. Lennox can... Lennox... Yes. We're sorry, but the, the rule in Great Britain is that the doctor has to examine the fighter in the ring. There's such a mob scene here <laughs> that we're going to have to wait a while. All right, Larry. As we wait for the interview with Lennox Lewis, let's move ahead a little bit in the format right now and go to November 13th. When at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific time, you will have your chance to watch the heavyweight title bout between Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bowe. Mr. Zander, did you see how hard I'm sweating? I'm not working as hard for nothing. When it's over, I'll still be the undisputed, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. The war of words always comes first. Several weeks ago, the inevitable posturing began. On one side, a brash, young, undefeated challenger, Riddick Bowe. On the other, a curiously reserved boxing star, world heavyweight champion, Evander Holyfield. From a desperate Brooklyn neighborhood, few would have predicted Bo would have come this far, this fast. As an amateur, he was tagged a lazy, heartless big mouth. But as a pro, Bo has benefited from the expert handling of manager Rock Newman and legendary trainer Eddie Futch. Newman remembers the earlier, less focused Riddick Bo. A prankster, mischievous, harmless, a knucklehead. Uh, but even in the midst of all of that, a very likable, lovable, fun-loving, kind of happy-go-lucky guy. Who, well, again, really just needed direction. And it appears that this bow knows how to listen. But if he keeps this up, don't stop it. In July, Bo left South African Pierre Cutzer bloody and battered. Holyfield had agreed to fight the winner, and Bo immediately dismissed the champ. Everybody's been saying that Evander Holyfield isn't a genuine heavyweight champion, including yourself, I should add. I know what you're about to say, but I, st I still don't believe he takes a punch as well as Pierre Coach. Since having won the title in 1990, Holyfield has defended it three times, but never without trouble. And Holyfield wobbles in the corner. He barely got by George Foreman, and he barely got by Larry Holmes. Slipped by Burke Cooper. There's no way he's going to get by me. All the fights that I ever knocked somebody out because they were trying to knock me out. And George Foreman didn't try to knock me out. Larry Holmes didn't try to knock me out. Burke Cooper did, and I knocked him out. Let's find out about the hearts that night. Let's find out about who wanted more. Who wanted more? Let's find out if you get knocked down, who gets up. You crazy. <laughs> Knock me down. Now say that again. I didn't hear that. Knock me down. It was so bad when they said the new. Undisputed, undisputed. Heavyweight tagging up the world. So the questions arise. Will youth be served? Will it be a night for a fresh 25-year-old undefeated in 31 fights? Or will Holyfield and his magnificent composure make youth irrelevant? Will it be a short bout with Bo making quick work of the champion with size and power? Or will it be a marathon, a long, agonizing duel decided by Holyfield's conditioning and heart? He's going to put a lot of pressure on me. I just want to see how he's going to react when I go upside his head. I think Powell is thinking 
just power thinking I'm the winner. In two weeks, amid the glowing neon of downtown Las Vegas, against the most capable challenger he has yet faced, Evander Holyfield defends his undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Catch it on TVKO, Friday the 13th at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific time. All right, we bring you back now to the chaos of ringside at Earl's Court. Coming up in just a couple of minutes, the results of the Holyfield Bow phone bowl, your votes on who you think is going to win that title fight, and a live interview with Evander about what he's just seen and the results of that poll and the upcoming fight. Right now, Larry Merchant is with Lennox Lewis. Larry. Okay, I think I am with Lennox Lewis this time. Lennox, you don't seem as stunned by the outcome of this fight as the rest of this crowd. Why? No, because I visualized before the fight what, what exactly I was going to do. I realized that Razor is a person that gets agitated really fast. And even though I'm quiet, you can still hear my silence. What does that mean exactly? You're looking across the ring. He was jumping up and down. He came out like 110 miles an hour. Did you feel that he was overexcited, that he was going to leave himself open? I, I looked into his eyes and just looked at his, you know, at his physical self, and I realized that you know, he was very, he, he looked scared to me, and uh, I was just calm, I, I, you know, I knew what I was going to do, and I, I knew what I wanted to do, so I just went out there and asserted myself and did it. What did you want to do? What had you seen about Razor Ruddick that resulted in the result we got? Well, I realized by watching tapes of him uh, that he keeps his left hand really low. Razor's never been in with a guy that throws a natural right hand that is, that is as fast as me. And that's, that was a surprise for Razor Ruddick. Is that why you threw those two wild rights in the first round, because you were anxious to, to, to get that in? I was very anxious. One of my biggest problems is that I get too over-anxious, and I want to prove myself too fast. But with the help of my team around with Courtney Sham, my conditioner, Harold Knight, Pepe Curris, Ali, and my sparring partners, you know, Tubbs and Weaver, they helped me to overcome that. What are your thoughts about Holyfield versus Bo and your opportunity to fight the winner? I believe that, you know, Holyfield, I give him the edge because he's a boxer and that he's, and he's a workaholic. But uh, before I said I was knocking at the door, I kicked down the door tonight. <laughs> I'm coming after Holyfield. Thank you very much, Lennox Lewis. Jim? All right, thanks a lot, Larry. George, you've been telling me all week Lewis was going to win this fight. You sold me yesterday, as did Larry. We knew about all his other qualities. Now we know about his power. He's got true power. There's no hype about this guy. He can not only become heavyweight champ of the world, but he can keep it for a long time fighting guys who are not really good predators, as you saw with Ruddick tonight. He tried to come forward, but he didn't know how. Uh, Patterson had taught him how to box. He was a confused fighter more than anything. So part of this is that Ruddick was overrated. Overrated at doing, at going to seek out knockouts. He's a good guy. If nothing else is happening, he will hurt you, but not tonight. It's been a good night for Lennox Lewis. All right, and a great night for British boxing fans, none of whom want to leave, incidentally. We're surrounded by the entire crowd in the arena. I don't think a single person has walked out. This is one they'll savor for a long time and what excitement we'll have here if Lewis does in fact as the contracts say he does get a chance to fight for the heavyweight champion I think it's gonna be a wonderful day it's gonna be a wonderful day for, for the whole world because like I said the world market now you're gonna see an international champion from another country challenging and probably winning the heavyweight championship of the world well that's interesting you just picked him to win the heavyweight championship now Holyfield's people have said that if Holyfield beats Bo they're willing to come fight Lewis here. I'm not sure that's a great idea. I don't think they really want to fight Lewis anywhere, if you ask me. This guy's got such a dynamite right hand. He's somebody you better let age a little bit like a piece of meat. A uh, piece of meat. Well, the WBC says it's going to make sure that the winner of Holyfield Bow fights Lennox Lewis. It's an experience Razor Ruddock has just had much, much to his displeasure, and Razor's ready to talk about it with Larry. All right, Razor... What, from your point of view, happened? Well, I think that, um, you know, I don't want to make an excuse. Lennox Lewis is a good fighter. I did not underestimate him at all. But, you know, fighting in this um, uh, climate is just, I, I, I can't make an excuse. I, um, I, I just wasn't warm enough, you know. And he, he didn't really hurt me, but um, he had me down. Uh, he shot me. And he never really hurt me, but he shot me and he got me down. So. I have to take my hat off to Lennox Lewis because we have to lose in digni with dignity too, you know, because we win with dignity and we lose with dignity. You seemed a little bit 
nervous, high-strung, agitated, almost over-eager when, when the fight started. Did you want to send him a message? Something like that, a little bit of intimidation, I think it was. Um, I figure that um, it, we're, we're, we are, we're warriors and we can't expect to win them all. And I, I, I am um, coming here. I try my best. And uh, hey, it happens. This happened to the best of the best of the, best of us all. Your old friends or, or old opponents from way back when you were teenagers. He seemed, from those experiences, not to be over intimidated by you. Well, no, but um, I wasn't really. Um, intimidated at all. I was just trying to send um, a message to him, like a little bit of, you know. This all right, do you think he's going to become the next heavyweight champion? Yeah, I think so, because anyone who beat me, I have to take my hat off to him, because first of all, it wasn't, I went um, 12 rounds with Mike Tyson with my jaw broken, but for some reason or another, this is the way the boxing game goes. Sometimes you lose, sometimes you win, you know what I mean? Thank you very much, Razor Reddick. Uh, all right, thank you. You're Jim. Classy as he was in defeat against Mike Tyson. All right, let's move on to other business. Take a look at the results of the phone poll. How did you vote on the subject of who is going to win Holyfield? Bo, well, you voted 55 to 45 percent in favor of Holyfield. So the public continues by a relatively small margin to back the champion, Evander Holyfield, against Riddick Bowe and about to come up on TVKO on the 13th of November. And right now joining us live from Houston, Texas is the still undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Evander Holyfield. Evander, welcome to HBO Sports again. Uh, before we get to talk of Lewis Ruddick, what do you think about the public's urge to say that you're going to win your fight with Riddick Bowe? It's a lot of smart people. Uh, you know, they, they right, I will win. All right, Evander, what did you think of Lennox Lewis's destruction of Ruddick? Well, Lennox fought a smart fight, and um, it seems that... Um, uh, he's more patient. He was using the jab, and, and I knew in a matter of time his razor rudder kept jabbing to the, uh, the body. He was going to catch him with an overhand right, and he was able to uh, catch him with a good overhand right. Evander, as one who has worked for years to improve your boxing skills, does it do your heart a little bit of good to see the boxer overpower the puncher the way Lewis did? Well, in general, I'm... Um, and fight such as Lennox fight and, and Razor. You know, I am favorite Razor because he's a two-hand fighter. It's just hard for just a, a knockout puncher with one hand to be able to be a, a slick boxer with good experience. And a fighter that's Evander, I know you don't. I know you don't want to look past the championship fight, but your managers, Lou Duva and Shelley Finkel, have indicated, at least preliminarily, that if you win that fight, you might consider coming here to London to fight Lewis. Would you reconsider that after what you saw here? Well, you know, my, my mind's just on uh, fighting Bo and getting through with Bo and taking a rest. And um, I deal with that next year sometime after I win the fight on the 13th. All right. I'm sorry, go ahead. All right, uh, Evander, I can't hear you very well because of all the chaos here, so I apologize for the fits and starts that we're having here. Now, you spent a lot of time following the Braves in the National League Championship Series and then in the World Series, about which your trainer said, we wish he were here in camp all the time. Are you satisfied that your training has gone well enough for you to be in peak shape against Riddick? Well, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm doing all, I did all I could do. I'm in great shape. I've been 12 rounds, and... And I look forward to November 13th. Uh, I have no complaints about anything. And I know no, November 13th I'll be ready. And I give my best. And I realize my best is good enough, I win. And it's been good enough every fight I've fought. And I'm looking forward to keeping the championship. Bo doesn't seem to offer you as much respect as some of your opponents have. He openly states that he doesn't think you can take his punch. Does that help to motivate you? Well, no, not at all. I, you know, I know what I can do. Uh, one thing Bo can say that he's never been in the ring with me, actually, in a fight. Uh, come November 13, he will realize that I can punch or not. Uh, the fact that if I can't, then he'll know. If I can, he would know. And everybody There's excitement. Yeah, that's right. There's excitement here tonight because everybody sees this as another step forward in the heavyweight division. It's exciting to look ahead to a championship fight in two weeks. Does it excite you? To see this sudden convergence of activity, big fights, legitimate challenges of the kind which will finally make the public sit up and say, yeah, Evander Holyfield fights the best. Well, I don't, I don't look at so much, um, 
you know, about me. I look at the, the boxing game itself. I truly believe that the Razor Ruddock fight and Leonard Lewis fight uh, put a little spark in a lot of people interest that the two best fighters are fighting each other. The Bo and my Bo and I fight, and the best man come out on top. I think you know it just make the whole game the whole game uh, better. And uh, I just look forward to you know going out there, taking care of Bo, then taking a rest, then look at the the uh, uh, possibility to fight Lennox Lewis and taking him out. What kind of a fight do you expect against Bo? Well, I, I truly believe it'll be a very uh, uh, a very aggressive fight. I realize that he do think that I I can't punch, but that's something that I'm willing to prove. And um, my I'm in great shape, and I'm looking forward to making him fight each and every second that he's in there, and hopefully get him out of there as soon as possible. Evander, um, you said in an earlier answer in this interview that you were looking forward to beating Bo and then taking a rest. How long a rest might that be? Well, at least to January. I'm, I'm, I'm fighting in November, and I'm, then after I'm getting ready for Thanksgiving, Christmas, then New Year, then after New Year, then I'm, I'm ready to talk about what's next. So a likely date for the next defense might be as early as April or May? That's possible. I, you know, I can't uh, say what's, what's ahead. No, I just got to look forward to November 13 against Reddick. And will you stick to the rules of the contracts as they are written and fight Lennox Lewis next if you beat Bo? Of course, I, I will fight Lennox Lewis next because this is next. Uh, not to the point that it's in the rules and regulations saying what I have to do. You know, I'm the heavyweight champion of the world, and, um, and I live by the rules and regulations. As the rules stimulates me to fight him next, then I would fight him next. Just because I told them I would fight him next, I would fight him next regardless to it was, uh, if any rule wasn't even in effect. My if words you are still... Yep, go ahead. So my word is you, good. Yep, we know that. We agree. We've done business with you for years, and we'll attest to that. Your word is good. Ladies and gentlemen, he's still the undisputed champion, and a very classy one at that. Evander, thank you as always for your good grace in joining us tonight. Thank you very much. All right. And that will be the Evander Holyfield versus Riddick Bow World Heavyweight Championship fight coming up on TBKO, our pay-per-view sister arm, Friday, November 13th, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 6 o'clock Pacific Time. Be sure to call your local cable operator for details on how to see that fight. All right, so you have seen Lennox Lewis's rapid destruction. 46 seconds of the second round of the former number one heavyweight contender under the rules of the WBC, Razor Ruddock. Now, another visit from the Crypt Keeper. Nothing warms the ghoul like a good rumble. <laughs> Nothing that is except two rumbles. <laughs> so, ghoulies, how about a nice fight night, fright night, double creature feature? Meldrick Taylor can keep his opponent in stitches, and you, my friend, on pins and needles. Back in Earl's Court, and your chance now to see the WBA World Welterweight Championship fight between Meldrick Taylor, the champion, and Crisanto Espana of Venezuela. Heretofore unknown, Larry, from Terry Norris to Crisanto Espana in six months. Is this a mark for Meldrick Taylor of how far the mighty has fallen? Yeah, this is a come down, but it's a come down for the best of all reasons. Meldrick Taylor has been a risk taker. Being a risk taker took him to the heights he was at. Being a risk taker took him into the ring with Terry Norris. Terry Norris took him out. But we have to keep something in mind. Risk taking is good in prize fighting. This kid uh, has been a whirlwind. Uh, he has had an intense, short career, and we never know where it's going to take him next. Keep in mind that after that he lost that controversial, heartbreaking decision or knockout to the great Julio Cesar Chavez, he came back and won the welterweight championship. He has to come back again now from that knockout by Terry Norris in order to get another fight with Julio Cesar Chavez. It's my information that they've already agreed to that fight for next year, but he's got to go through a pretty tough 
Venezuelan Irishman tonight to do it. Indeed, and George Foreman, it's one of the oldest and most familiar stories in the sport. Taylor tries to come back now from a devastating knockout at the hands of Norris. What do you make of Meldrick's chances to do it? Well, Meldrick's got all the equipment to, to be on top. I, I do believe his loss was a managerial problem in the first place. He was just matched with the wrong guy at the wrong time. This guy still got the world at his feet. He can still become and reclaim greatness if one. 147 pound world championship fight. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape now from Meldrick Taylor and Crisanto Espana. And you will see that Taylor is two years younger at 26. Espana is a lanky welterweight, five feet, 11 inches tall. Exceptionally long arms give him a 10 inch reach advantage. Punch stat numbers, Larry. All right, let's take a look at the uh, fight averages. They throw roughly the same amount of punches, land about the same, but they've had far different levels of competition. And here are the, the jab picture. Taylor throws many more jabs. He's going to have to use that jab to get in close to Espana tonight, past that reach. And now for the rules of this welterweight championship bout, let's go to Harold Letterman. Crisanto Espanda and Meldrick Taylor will box tonight using the rules of the World Boxing Association. Twelve rounds, three judges scoring the fight on a ten-point must system, no standing eight count. The three knockdown rule is in effect. You can be saved by the bell in the last round only, and in case a cut is caused by an accidental butt, and that cut causes the fight to be stopped, we will go to the scorecards if the three rounds have been completed before that it's a technical draw. Jim? All right, let's reestablish for you. This bout has taken place before the Lewis Ruddock fight. You are watching a taped recording of it coming up. We will pick up the action between Taylor and Espana in round number one. Twelve rounds for the WBA welterweight championship of the world. Meldrick Taylor, still the title holder. His championship was not at stake in his four-round knockout loss to Terry Norris in May of this year against Cristanto Espana. Originally from Venezuela, he spent the first four years of his professional boxing career in Venezuela, but only had a total of five fights. So at that point, he searched for another place in the world to continue his professional career and found a home with promoter Barney Eastwood in Northern Ireland. Espana, now married to a Northern Irish woman, lives about 16 kilometers down the road from Belfast in the town of Bangor and regards himself as just as much Northern Irish at this point as Venezuela. He is unbeaten in his professional career and that is some credential to bring into this bout with Meldrick Taylor. Of course the class of his opposition was much lower than the class of Taylor's opposition and that is the principal thing we have going into this fight of knowing how competitive he will be. And there's the record from Eldrick Taylor. 29 wins. The only losses were to Julio Cesar Chavez in the dramatic, unforgettable bout. Stopped with two seconds to go and Taylor leading on two of three scorecards. And of course, the knockout loss to the heavier Terry Norris, May 9 of 1992. And now let's go to Mike Goodall, the ring announcer, for the pre-fight introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, from Earl's Court, London, sponsored by Nightstick, Frank Maloney for Championship Enterprises and the main events in association with Murad Mohammed, 3M Promotions Incorporated, presents a contest of 12 three-minute rounds to decide the WBA Welterweight Championship of the World. The officials appointed for this contest, the supervisor in charge, Mr. Nipper Reed of London. The timekeeper, Mr. Lou Hubbard from Norwich, England. The judges are Mr. Justo Vasquez of Madrid in Spain, Mr. Gut. Jotras of Montreal, Canada, and Manuel Rodriguez of Barranca, Colombia. The referee for this contest in charge is Mr. John Coyle from England, officiating in his 19th World Championship contest. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing in the red corner, wearing the black trunks with the silver trim, 
from La Flor Suridad Boulevard, Venezuela, boxing out of Ireland. His record reads 27 contests, 27 wins, 23 by KO. Would you please welcome the challenger, Cristiano Espana. In the blue corner, wearing the black trunks, his record wins 29 wins, two losses, and one draw. 15 KOs. The welterweight, WBA welterweight champion of the world from Philadelphia, Meldrick Taylor. At the weigh-in today, Espania scaled 147 pounds, that's 10 stone, 7 pounds. Meldrick, 146 and a half pounds, 10 stone, 6 and a half pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, the WBA Welterweight Championship of the World. Gentlemen. Watching Espana jump up and down in this corner, waiting for all this to come about, it occurred to me he could do that from now till Christmas, Jim, because he used to be a marathon runner of all things, and he still routinely goes for 15 and 20 mile runs on his off weekends. And in addition to the unusual training regimen, Larry, he has one of the most unusual bodies we've seen in recent history in the welterweight division. Exceptionally long arms, George. And Taylor, on the other hand, is a relatively short-armed, compact, compactly built fighter. And I think it's never been so important as to about jump up and down as in this building is real cold. And that just doesn't help Mildred Taylor because he's a fast starter. He needs to be a fast starter. The other guy has been spending time in Ireland, so his body should warm up a lot easier. What we're seeing right off the bell here is Taylor trying to revert to his old boxing ways. They've been trying to get him to do that for a couple of years, but it, but it took Norris Terry Norris to convince him that that's the way he really has to fight against these bigger men. Well, he talks the talk now. We'll see if he can walk the walk in the ring. Will he be the Will of the Wisp boxer who came on to earn world championships at 135 and 140 and 147 pounds? Or will he in fact be the slugger that he tried to be when he stood in front of Terry Norris six months ago. I think Mildred Taylor will box about as long as a polar bear would wear a snowshoe. <laughs> he's going back to his Philadelphia region. Anytime he gets hit, he's going to barrel down and try to hit you back. One of the things you must love about Meldrick Taylor is the heart of a warrior. He loves to mix it up. So far, Crisanto Espana's long jab in the early going has begun to pose a problem for Taylor. And now Espana tries to bring the right hand behind the jab. If you ask me, Mildred Taylor shouldn't be moving so much. I mean, why? He's not fighting some guy who's going to chase him. He's not a true aggressor, just a long jab. Well, when Taylor was at his most effective for the first nine or ten rounds of the Chavez fight, he was moving in and out, but basically staying close to Chavez, beginning and ending tight exchanges around the body. Boy, what a good right hand to the body by Taylor that time. He still has the fast hands, George. And when you're fighting a guy of this nature as a sponsor, you've got to land a lot of body shots because this guy's going to get stronger as the fight goes on. The more body punches you land, the less capable he'll be able to land, hit you with a hard shot as the fight gets long and longer. 14 seconds, now 10 seconds remaining in round number one. Meldrick Taylor defending his 147-pound championship against an undefeated fighter we've never seen before. One of the things I see here is something I saw on the tapes of España and that I liked a lot which is that when his opponent punches, 
He punches. He doesn't wait for his opponent to stop. I know, I know, I know he's going, but listen, 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 listen to me. Listen to me, listen to me. I know listen you know what you're doing. I'm doing. I'm in there. Are you going to listen to me? Now, you're going to listen to me. Now, listen. Look, man. Don't run from him. Never run from him, but don't run from him. Well, be sure to join us Sunday morning, November 1, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern and Pacific for HBO's Countdown to Holyfield Bow. We'll take an in-depth look at both fighters and their respective camps as they prepare for their November 13 heavyweight championship fight. If you missed tomorrow's broadcast of the Countdown to Holyfield Bow, you can watch it Wednesday, November 4, at 7.30 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. Countdown to Holyfield Bow. You see, Jab, okay. Then, when you get the opportunity, body. Body shot. Then, okay. Go ahead, head up to the body. Georgie Benton was pleading with Taylor between rounds not to run from Espana, to box him, move, but not run. Confirming what you said earlier, George. Yeah, you got to move in and out. Now, Taylor bumped heads that time. That, just not going to happen when you... Just had a knockout a few months ago. Now Duba yelling from the corner. Lou Duba, that is, yelling to Taylor. That's the range. That's the range. Meldrick took a low blow. Referee John Coyle did nothing about it. We'll watch that story and see if it develops. Once you have a fighter to be knocked out as recent as Taylor lost, you just can't fuss at him in the corner anymore. You got to let this guy, let it all just materialize. Let him get his confidence back as the fight goes on. You argue in the corner, it's going to pay off in the fight if you just catch him right hands too early. Right hand landed over the top for Hispania. So far, the length of Hispania's arms has proven a problem for Taylor. He'll have to solve the riddle of how to get inside and land his punches to the body. That head but a little earlier did cause some bleeding on Hispania. Bleeding on Hispania? Well, let's look for that, George. It'll be on the left side, up high. Saw Meldrick trying to double up with the left hook. When he's right, the left hook to the body is maybe his best punch. Good short right hand inside by Taylor. As finally came back with a right hand of his own. Meldrick missed with the left hook as Espana ducked away. Well, you're right about the abrasion on Espana's forehead. I can see it now, George, at close range. But Espana lands a right hand over the top. Meldrick comes back, misses with a left and a right. Now, Meldrick is going to be awful surprised at the extent of which his power is going to be a bit more effective this time because he's in with somebody 147 pounds like himself. So he can mix it up a little more. He needn't be too cautious. But this, is my a, mind. this is a strong 147 pound guy. He has his deep chest, long, thin limbs, a very unusual body, completely fearless, and right now in control of the fight. And Taylor, though he scored knockouts at 140 pounds, hasn't knocked anybody out at 147, except for a fighter named Ernie Chavez, who was a 140 pounder coming up. Taylor landed a good, solid right hand in close. Right. Now, once Taylor finds this bit of comfort and realizes, hey, this fight may go for a few rounds, don't try to do it in the first few rounds, wait around, frustrate this guy with movement. And blood is coming out of Meldrick Taylor's mouth. Hmm. Okay, come on. Hold mm -hmm. well, the head. Okay. Yeah, he hit to the head. Yeah, yeah okay. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing there. Nothing. Nothing. Uh -huh. Okay, come on. Come on, Gisando. That's the reward you have to do. You make the guy brave. Now just keep doing what you're doing. Keep the hands up good and high. Be alert. Keep the jab going. Stick it at his chest, stick it at his belly, but double up. Double up with your jab so he can't get the right hand to go. You understand? So he's fighting your jab with his right hand, so he can't he can't punch and block at the same time, can he? All right, well, keep the jab going. Couple keep now. Don't punch from too far away. You're reaching at him too much. Okay, okay all right. Now, when you're down there, let's start going to that body. You heard him with a couple body shots there, right? Get down there, stay down there, go to that body, and just throw it. Go, 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 wait. Come on. Come on. Good box. 
Round three begins between Taylor and Espana. At some point, you're going to pick up there may be a lack, a lack of trust between Mildred Taylor and his corner because he felt they gave him some bad instructions against his last fight, in his last fight. And so they're trying to reestablish this communication again. A lot of arguing and a lot of trust. Taylor landed a right hand inside. Espana countered with a left hook that caught Taylor flush on the cheek. Now Meldrick goes back to the body. And the Meldrick Taylor, who was moving side to side and circling in round one, is now standing in front of Espana, much the way he stood in front of Terry Norris. And I think he can do it with a bit more confidence this time. This guy has not the power of a Terry Norris. Espana's jab landing. Meldrick has sometimes been short with the jab. Espana reaching over the top with the right hand. Landed a low blow and got away with it again. And now Taylor turns to referee John Coyle and says, ask him to keep him up, please. Taylor's corner is telling him to get with that jab, which is a mistake. He did not jab yet. This guy's got arms as long as this ring. Why should he exchange jabs with him? Espana landed a left when Meldrick came in close. Mildred waiting around for a good active jab. He's going to get hit with a lot of right hands. And there's a left hand that Espana landed. Again, flush. Most of the solid blows in the fight so far landed by the challenger. Espana seems to be making Taylor pay a price every time he tries to get in close. Now Taylor willing to wait back and try to block Espana's punches with his gloves. But it's hard to mount an offense that way. Espana's looping left hand bothered Meldrick a little bit. Once you've been knocked out in your career, let me tell you, you go back into the ring and the gloves hit you, even if they're not hard, it sounds like drums beating. Boom! Because the fear that you might be knocked out again is in your head at all times. A moment ago, Espana came to Taylor and Meldrick landed a combination to the body, which was his best combination so far in the fight. He's going to have to solve the riddle of how to get close to Espana, George, and maybe the best way is to let the man come to him. No doubt about it, because he's, he's shot. He's a little shy now. A lot of punches are going to hurt him tonight that really, in instance, is not hurting him. Right hand solid by Espana. Meldrick is wobbled. Referee John Coyle says fight on. Meldrick avoided a knockdown by catching his glove on the canvas, but he's in trouble. And not in as much trouble as against Norris, but Espana is looking to hurt him with some more and I believe Taylor thought it was a knockdown. He looked at the at the referee thinking it was going to be called a knockdown. So you don't get brave, you know? Just keep doing what you're doing, right? Now you're all there. Come on, baby. Don't you get close? That's it. Now look, this guy can't really fight. He ain't no hell of a fighter. He's maybe a little strong. You understand? But all you gotta do is keep your jab going and then settle down, you understand? Settle down and get yourself together. Now you got this guy under control. Okay. Now the guy, he, now he's going to probably come out, you know, trying to get rid of him. That's the first punch that really hurt. All right, let's see, Espana, how he works. He's very clever. He's had his, a good school schooling in Venezuela. And oh, the, Harold Letterman, is that really a knockdown? Larry, that's a knockdown. If any part of your body, except the soles of your feet, touch the canvas, it's a knockdown. The referee missed it. It was absolutely a knockdown. Should be a 10-8 round. Round four begins. Meldrick Taylor appeared to have been knocked down, at least technically, toward the end of round three. He touched his glove against the canvas to maintain support after a left and a right by Espana. Now Meldrick tries to reestablish confidence in round four, and so far it has been like walking on eggs for Meldrick Taylor. Espana increasingly confident and throwing the left hook with gusto, George. No doubt about it. Taylor's just had, like I said, the, the recent uh, defeat. He's cautious, over-cautious, but now he should not take any fight to this guy. Don't give him any courage. Box him. Stay away. Box. How do you stay away from a guy with such long arms, George? Because the guy never throws a punch unless he gets his feet flat, pl uh, fat, platted in. Doesn't throw anything on the tip of his ball of his feet. He's, he's waiting. Meldrick steps in and goes to the body. 
Landed the left, the right was blocked. Trying to fight his way in with the jab. Now Espana swinging from side to side with rights and lefts, and Taylor seems unable to block them. Espana sticks the jab. Taylor finally blocks the left, but takes a chopping right. And that punch looked like it shook Taylor also. And it's all going back to Philadelphia now. Left and a right for Espana. He continues to dictate the tempo inside. Taylor saying he can't lose two in a row, so he's going to try everything he's can, he can to win this boxing match. Career on the line here, George, for a young man who was a 1984 Olympic gold medalist, one of the youngest gold medalists ever, had a brilliant early professional career, surprised everybody with a draw against Howard Davis, surprised everybody with an upset win over Buddy McGirt, fought the most brilliant fight against Julio Cesar Chavez that any opponent has ever produced, and it's been tough moments galore since then for Meldrick Taylor. Sure, he came on and won a welterweight championship in a great fight against Aaron Davis, but since that time, moments like this have continued to proliferate. And after the knockout loss to Terry Norris, at least one national magazine called Meldrick Taylor a shot fighter. Is he? He has to prove tonight that he is. I think already he's proven he's not a shot fighter. Got up off the canvas and took the fight right back to this guy. And, of course, the big thing right here is that the rematch with Chavez is, appears to be in jeopardy, serious jeopardy. I think he's in the match of his life right now. He's most effective when he stays close. You hit this guy, get close to him, stop backing away. Another long right hand by Espana and another to finish the round. Now, listen to me. Now, you're doing all right with this guy. But box with more confidence. You understand what I'm saying, Nick? Fuck it up. Now the guy hit you with some good shots and you took the damn shots, right? Mm -hmm. So now get get confidence. You understand? Mm -hmm. Take that jab and stick this guy. Don't be moving away from him too too much. See, that's why you get nailed. Harold Letterman, how do you score the fight so far? Larry, three rounds to one, 39-36 Crisanto Espana. That right hand is slamming home into Meldrick Taylor's jaw. That that's a real Terry Norris overhand right hand that Crisanto Espana's throwing, and it's really landing hard and doing a lot of damage. I gave Crisanto Espana a 10-8 round in the third round. I thought the referee missed it. His glove definitely touched the uh, canvas. It should have been called a knockdown. Certainly a 10-8 round for Espana. Let's take a look at Espana landing another right hand here at the end of the round. I have Espana winning all four rounds. Round five begins. In the first four rounds, Meldrick Taylor, by our punch count numbers, has landed only 24% of 251 attempted punches. Espana has thrown more punches and landed at about a 10% higher rate. And in the closing seconds of round four, Espana rocked Taylor twice more with right hands. So you've had the one near knockdown and various other lefts and rights which appear to have wobbled Meldrick Taylor. He's having a tough time defending his WBA welterweight championship. Taylor, when, it, when he finishes combination, he should get closer to this guy. Normally, he's finishing too far away, and he gets hit with this right overhand right. Like get that. closer. Get closer, his corner should tell him. How do you get closer without paying is the price he's paying? The guy is not interested in hitting Taylor when he's close at all. Only when he's far away. I think you got a good point, George. He does not appear to be an inside grappler. But if Taylor stays out here and lets the guy use his long arms for leverage and extension, he's in trouble. He's, he's definitely a long arm puncher, and he likes that distance. Well, there he landed a left hook in close. So that belies my notion for a moment. But Meldrick is still trying to find a solution as to how to get in close and control the action. Another left hand landed for Espana. The way to get in close is you, you lay in a couple of punches, then stay close. Taylor going to the body. He should keep going to the body to try to slow this guy down. That, was the, best, that was the best 10 seconds of the fight for Taylor, in close. Taylor having to take some punishment to give it, but he's beginning to step up the tempo of his own offense. Ducking punches inside. Staying close. Now let's see if you'll remember to go to the body. Takes two left hands right.
fighting them out. They never should have told Taylor to box this guy with such long arms. Should have been fighting like this from the beginning. Well, sometimes even a great corner can be the wrong corner for a particular fighter. And this marks the second fight in a row, George, in which you believe that the on-paper tremendous corner of Lou Duba and George Benton are letting Meldrick Taylor down. Right, they're trying to make him regress to the days when he was a boxer. Hey, he's a big, strong guy from Philadelphia. Let him fight. I don't know, George. He's never had punching power at 147 pounds. Maybe he can gain it with more confidence. Taylor landed a right hand inside. Espana lands a right. Oh, here. Yeah. Come on, deep breath. Come on, deep. Come on, deep. Again. Come on. How do you feel, Sam? You feel good? Wonderful, Dan. Come on. Come on. Don't, don't fight with him inside. Okay? This WBA World Welterweight Championship fight appears on the air as the second half of our HBO doubleheader tonight in case you tuned in late and missed the WBC heavyweight title eliminator between Ray Zerotic and Lennox Lewis, which we showed earlier this evening. We will be rebroadcasting that important contest later tonight at 1 o'clock in the morning, Eastern and Pacific time. No trick. That's the treat. Be with us at 1 a.m. Eastern and Pacific to see Lewis and Ruddock. Now you're boxing. That's what to do. Come on, baby. Now you're coming on. Now you're coming on. Come on. Round six. Round six of a scheduled 12 for the WBA welterweight title. Meldrick Taylor, still the title holder, lands a big right hand to start round six. Esponzo is a good boxer, but how, what are you going to run into tough Philadelphia when you're li living in Ireland? This guy should fight him. At all times, Taylor should be fighting this guy. And Espana has a great left jab, but he's not a power puncher up close. Well, of course, George, there are some who would say that the mean streets of Belfast will outstrip Philadelphia for meanness. That is true. <laughs> No scotch. He fights in the gym in Northern Ireland every day. That's the same gym that produced, among others, the famous featherweight titleist Barry McGuigan. And finally, referee John Coyle has to take action about a low blow as Meldrick Taylor goes to his knees. He should not have to be wearing trunks like that. I don't even see the evidence of a good cup up close to him. The trunks he's wearing is not very protective. I mean, he has to have to build a tru uh, cup to protect to have fashion outrunning function with those trunks. And the referee is taking a point away from Espana, which seems odd to me since he never even warned it before. Harold, what's the rule here on Taylor's recovery? Watch him, it was an accidental clear-cut low blow. Meldrick has up to five minutes to recuperate, at which time, you know, if he doesn't continue, he loses. All right, he's coming out of the corner, so no Looks problem. Looks like there. he should have taken Re more time. Right, referee John Coyle did deduct the point from Crisanto Espana for the low blow. Good left hook by Mildred Taylor. To the body. Outstanding. Right hand also. Taylor fighting with new aggressiveness. Maybe the low blow has given him the incentive he needs to simply seize command of the bout. Giving and taking. Taylor goes to the low blow and gets away with one of his own. to the side of the head. For the first 30 seconds after the low blow stoppage, Meldrick Taylor has his best 30 seconds of the fight. But now Espana lands one of those lengthy right hands and Meldrick slows down again. He takes a breather and stands outside. He should take a breather inside. He won't get hit with so many overhand rights. Taylor should stay a little closer. Well, you know, one thing Meldrick has never tried to do and never learned to do in his career is to fight along the ropes. And it looks to me, George, as if he knew how to do that, he might be able to confuse Espana a little more than he has. Any little thing he can throw in at this time would only help. But he's got to stay a little closer to Espana. They are fighting in a 
20-foot, 8-inch ring. It is cavernous. There's the long right hand by Espana. Melvin Taylor in trouble again. Taylor ready to go down if Espana lands one more of those rights over the top. And, of course, that's the danger in becoming aggressive, that he was going to walk into a punch like that, which he did. He's only getting hit on the outside. If he stay close, nothing is going to happen. Espana uses the left, sets up the right. Meldrick is either playing possum or in terrible trouble. Not playing possum. Now he finally grabs and holds. And holds. But wobbles backwards. And Melbourne to the next round. And wobbles to his corner. No. No. Listen. This is when you need a father figure. You don't need a corner now. Lou Duba should just jump in and say, I'm with you. I'm with you. Outside again. All right, all right, all right. Now, look, you listen to me, Melvin. The guy can't fight a lick on the inside, and that's where you belong. You know, you got to stay close to the guy. Yeah, yeah. No, Melvin, the guy can't fight a lick inside. I'm telling you, but he's hitting you with the long punches from the outside. Inside is where you should be. Come on, baby. You understand? Come on, Come on man. Now, Mel, get yourself together and get close to this guy and stay close. Now, Mel, get yourself right, together. Stay close. Now, stay on the inside move. now. Move. Okay, let's take a look and see how Espana did this. That little chopping right seemed to send Taylor off balance, and Espana went on the attack. Taylor cannot get to Espana without exposing himself to those punches because Espana steps back. What we're seeing here is the limitations of Taylor against bigger men. He is a short fighter who is not powerful so that even when he gets inside, he doesn't hurt his opponent unless he can land fuselades of punches. And this guy is very clever. He's waiting for him to come to him, but step back, and he's looking for an opening, and he's able to deliver. Larry, he doesn't need to hurt him. He needs to just stay close and win points. It's not about hurting the guy. It's about staying away from the power, which is outside. Now, his corner told him to stay close. It's too late. He should have told him that initially. He's just finding out the good news. Hey. Santo Espana lands another right hand flush on Meldrick Taylor's face. Taylor with specific instructions from George Benton to get inside. Seemingly at a loss as to how to do it. Espana has him in trouble again. And if Meldrick Taylor survives this round, it still seems, to me at least, like only a matter of time. I'll tell you guys, management decisions in boxing are idiosyncratic. It's certainly an inexact science. But over the long haul, I'm of the opinion that Meldrick Taylor was a 140-pound fighter who never should have gone to 147 pounds, championship or no championship. Well, but that was his decision because he didn't, couldn't make the weight anymore. And this is not a management decision that the problem is here. He had to fight a mandatory challenge, and that's when his trouble began. Because Espana is too strong for him, and he's too clever. Taylor looking weary, still trying. You get Milton Taylor before his last fight, he could have beaten this guy in easily. But now his confidence has been shot. Corner don't know, tell him to box, then tell him to stay close. Everybody's confused. big an imprint did Terry Norris's right hand make on Meldrick Taylor's career? You are seeing the fallout tonight, along with the surprisingly effective performance of a heretofore unknown contender named Crisanto Espana. Now, Taylor is trying to protect himself by, from the right hand by bringing his right hand from the near his waist back up to his face, and he's not timing it. The best thing to do is lay that right hand right up there beside your left, left side of your face and keep it there. George, with all due respect, this isn't a matter of strategy. I don't think that anything Meldrick Taylor could do would undo what this guy is doing to him because he's just got the, the size and the answers for whatever Taylor, as a small, short welterweight, can do with him. You got a feel for Taylor. He's at the end of all these long arm punches, and it's a riddle he just hasn't solved. Now, listen to me, on, listen to me. How are you coming on? Now, listen to me. Now, you got to suck it up. Now, you see, this guy just threw the book at you. You feel 
You understand? Now, if you suck it up, Mel, you can kill this guy. This guy is not a hell of a fighter, Mel. Come on. Uh -huh. Harold Letterman, what you're doing give us your score. Man. Larry, 67-63, five rounds to two, as Chris Santo is buying you. Larry, round six was really very, very interesting. Now, it was a 10-8 round, clearly a 10-8 round for Chris Santo Espana, but he loses one point because the referee takes away a point and a low blow becomes 9-8. to eight. But Espana, uh, five rounds to two so far. Suck it up and get close to this guy. This is an early stage of the round as Espana goes on the attack. I have him ahead six rounds to one, and this is the end of the round. Meldrick Taylor took a terrible beating in that round. As they go to round eight, you have the beginnings numerically of a mismatch. My punch count numbers in round number seven, Meldrick Taylor landed only 11 of 56 attempted punches. Crisanto Espana, 41 of 88. Now, Espana has better start trying to protect his lead now. He gets into a many more mix-up like that. Some left hook could come from somewhere out of the sky and drop him. But as the fight goes on, if it follows this pattern, George, you have to begin to consider what kind of welterweight champion is Crisanto Espana going to make? And will he insist on defending the title in Belfast, Northern Ireland, which could make for some fascinating moments in the division? And with a left jab like that, he can win internationally. Once you got a good jab like that, you can fight anybody, and even in their hometown. I think his body is a huge advantage, too. He has these long arms. He's not skinny. He's got a deep chest. Sucks up a lot of oxygen, which means he recovers quick. I think he might might start an exodus from Venezuela to Belfast. <laughs> Espana kind of just lay that right hand out there. He doesn't give any motion or power to it. Lays it out there to just connect. And we should mention here that he had a, a younger brother who once was a lightweight champion. Ernesto Espana, the man who talked Barney Eastwood, promoter and manager, into taking this Espana on. If the fight goes another round like it is now, it would be in the interest of Duba and his camp to maybe even consider stopping the fight. Two knockouts, that much punishment. I agree with you, George. And I think that perhaps Meldrick Taylor does too right now. I think he's got to stop the fight. No, he's not going to stop the fight. That's a very brave referee. And it's a still brave Meldrick Taylor, and he always has been. A warrior's heart, which is going to betray him here. John Coyle, within moments of stopping the fight, Lou Dubas on the top step, and they both make the decision at the same moment. Duba was stepping into the ring as Coyle spread his arms to stop the bout. If Meldrick Taylor was a shot fighter coming into this fight, he's a dead fighter now. You win some and you lose some. You try to win more than you lose. 28-year-old <laughs> Crisanto Espana out of Venezuela, now living and fighting out of Belfast, Northern Ireland, has won them all in his career, 28 in a row. And now he's the WBA welterweight champion of the world. I think what could have happened and should have happened, Milton Taylor should have taken off at least a year after the last beat. Let's take a look at the first knockdown, gentlemen. Well, this is a knockdown that started way back in the first round when Espana already showed signs of being a little bit too much for Taylor, and he just gradually built on that. This is the same sequence of punches. Gustano Espana has turned out to be a world-class champion. And now let's look at the end of the fight about 15 or 20 seconds after it should have been stopped. But the referee did give Taylor the champion's privilege of going on. Well, when you remember what Meldrick Taylor was not too long ago, this is hard to watch. And harder yet to watch for Julio Cesar Chavez, who has just watched a couple million go down the drain. At least. 
But the final particulars on this, let's go up to ring announcer Mike Goodall. Ladies and gentlemen, after two minutes, 11 seconds of the eighth round, the referee has stopped the contest. Meldrick Taylor being in no position to defend himself. The winner and new WBA welterweight champion of the world, Cristiano Espana! <laughs> to present the belt, the supervisor in charge, Nipper Reed. So Crisanto Espana tries on a brand new belt. And I think he's going to wear it with pride. I mean, this guy's got a great left jab, and who would have thought a guy boxing and training in Ireland would have an uppercut like that? I think he's going to be a very tough customer in the welterweight division. The other champions, Maurice Blocker, is the championship or the champion under the International Boxing Federation's aegis. Good fighters, both fighters. I think it's an excellent fight. It's a great match for television. And uh, believe me, they were evenly matched. The best man won tonight. And the WBC World Welterweight Champion is James Buddy McGirt, who is headed for a date next year with Pernell Whitaker, Meldrick Taylor's longtime stablemate and very close friend. Normally at this point, you would see our Larry Merchant interviewing in this case, winner and loser in the ring. But in Great Britain, fighters are not interviewed in the ring following a fight because first, they must both be examined by ring doctors. And second, the British Boxing Board of Control does not like the in the ring confusion, which follows from having so many people in the ring immediately following the fight. So consequently, we wait now with Larry at ringside for the fighters to be brought to us. Final punch stat numbers, and there you have the statistical mismatch. Rizanto Espana landing nearly 40% of 586 punches. Meldrick Taylor's connect percentage went down from round to round as the fight went on. And now we go to Larry Merchant with the brand new WBA welterweight champ. Cristiano Espana, are you surprised how easy this was for you? No, I'm not surprised because I am ready for that fight. I know Magic. Yeah, I think uh, I've been Magic Taylor. Meldrick Taylor has such a reputation as a good fighter. Did that not bother you at all? Yes, um, uh, very much. But I am telling very well, I'm very confident I not come out of Magic Taylor. Where did you realize that you were dominating him and that you were going to win this fight? Because I believe in myself. Where in the ring, during this fight, when did you sense that the fight was yours? And I started in the beginning of the fight. I know the fight is mine. Why? Because I, I don't feel Magic is strong enough for me. He's not a strong welterweight. No, not strong. Very fast welterweight, but not strong. And your reach advantage, he could not get to you. Oh, well, my reach had a lot of me with my jab. But I was ready for that fight. Did you think you had a knockdown earlier in the fight when he went down with his both hands to the canvas? Yes, yes. Were you surprised that they didn't call it a knockdown? Did you protest at all? No, 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 sir. Did you think that eventually you were going to get him at that point? Yes, uh, see, uh, the fight is 12 rounds. I, I, and then Raul has my chance. Do you think that he is through as a fighter now? Yes, I think. He can't fight anymore, not as a welterweight? No, no, in welterweight. I can't fight in, in welterweight. No, no way. Well, you're the second member of your family to hold the world championship. Yes. That must be a very good feeling for you. Yes, very good for me, for my family, my mom, the second song world champion. Uh, the, and very, very town, very, very, very small town in Suda Bolivar. I am a farmer. And the other 13 children, the other 13 brothers and sisters of yours must be watching. Yes, maybe watch, maybe not. <laughs> well, you're the champion of that big family now as well as the champion 
of the WBA welterweight division. Thank you very much for a wonderful fight. Congratulations. And now back to Jim. All right. Thanks very much, Larry. And George, if it shows us one thing, it shows us how big the world of boxing is. You study and study. You think you know everybody. And all of a sudden, somebody comes out of the woodwork and you say, wow, look at this guy. A lot of people thought coming in, based on what they'd seen on tape, that Crisanto Espana was dangerous. Now we know how dangerous he was. Talk about the world market, my goodness. Everybody being competitive. We've seen it here tonight for a bad day for Mildred Taylor, but he shouldn't feel bad. He's had a good career. Lots of wins, lots of, vic lots of victories, and lots of money. And, of course, uh, amid what will be seen as his worst defeat, one of Taylor's great qualities still obvious, there's no quit in Meldrick Taylor. Yeah, and uh, he, he displayed a lot of courage tonight, a lot more than I had given him credit to have. He wouldn't quit. And, incidentally, we had expected to bring you a post-fight interview with Meldrick Taylor, but as Larry was talking to Crisanto Espana, Lou Duva and George Benton took Meldrick Taylor to the locker room. We may, may very well not get a chance to speak to him tonight. And here, once again, a look back at the closing stages of the fight as Crisanto Espana pounded away at will at a by now still willing but defenseless Meldrick Taylor and referee John Coyle stepped in to stop it. All right, let's reestablish. All of that was recorded earlier. We bring you back to real time in Earl's Court now, and we'll turn to Larry Merchant for his final comments on the arrival of a new welterweight champion, Crisanto Espana. Well, you got to like Espana and his story. His brother was a champion, one of 15 kids, goes to Ireland from Venezuela, <laughs> of all things, to take up boxing, sticks with it at the age of 28. He gets a shot at a well-known, high-profile, once terrific fighter, and does everything he has to do to dominate the fight. But my thoughts mainly are about Meldrick Taylor, who's been such a terrific fighter for us. There are some fighters who are just destined to live fast and die young in the ring. And he is one of them because of the way he's made, because he's not big enough to be a welterweight, can't make lightweight anymore. But he's given us everything, and I can only give him my highest praises and my wishes for a good future. I agree, and we'll miss him. We'll be back in a moment to talk to you about Lewis Ruddock. First, let's turn to George for his final comments on that fight. And George, here's what's going to happen. All those experts who picked Ruddock to knock out Lewis are now going to have to say that Tyson too, took too much out of him, and he wasn't the same fighter anymore. You put any stock in that? Uh, excuses, excuses. <laughs> you can do nothing but praise Lennox Lewis. He fought a good fight. He didn't get sh intimidated stood back with the sneak right hand. I never thought he could do it so early, but he's proved that he's a world-class fighter. He can become heavyweight champ of the world and keep the title for a long time if he keeps his shoes on. The so right which foot. opponent would stand, which opponent would have the best style to stand him in good stead against Lewis? Would it be Holyfield or Bo? Rudick Bo stands up tall in the same fashion as a Rudder did. He could get knocked out easily if he's not properly prepared. I think Evander Holyfield, because he's lower, can hide for a few more rounds, but eventually he'd even get caught with that sneak right hand. You're picking Lewis to become heavyweight champ. No doubt about it. This guy even scares me. <laughs> on Halloween night, that's appropriate. Larry Merchant, your final thoughts on Lennox Lewis's destruction of Riddick, uh, Razor Ruddock. And I should say that Larry, like George, has for months picked Lewis to win this fight. I didn't expect it to happen quite the way it did, uh, Jim. I didn't expect that Razor Ruddock was going to hang his head out there on uh, Halloween like a, a jack-o'-lantern and that this guy was just going to knock it off. Uh, I don't know any expert who knew that Ruddock, because he carried his hands lo low, was vulnerable to that punch because everybody had been so mesmerized and tantalized by his power. I think more to the point is why he was so overrated, Ruddock. As I said before the fight, Here's a guy whose reputation is based on two defeats. I don't care how brave he was against Tyson, how arrogant he was against Tyson. He lost 16 out of the 19 rounds. That tells me something about what kind of fighter he was. I think he thought he was a better fighter than he was. Most people did. And uh, the, uh, Lennox Lewis tonight uh, showed what kind of fighter Ruddick was and what kind of fighter he is and is going to be. All right, and let's take one final look now at this immense explosion in the heavyweight division, at least the final stages thereof. The last few punches in Lennox Lewis's 3-minute, 46-second destruction of Razor Ruddock, which now puts Lewis in line to fight for the heavyweight championship. This, the third knockdown of the brief bout, 
it was quite enough for referee Joe Cortez. So, coming up immediately following tonight's coverage of World Championship Boxing, we ask you to stay tuned for HBO Comedy Hour, Damon Wayans' The Last Stand, already in progress, to be followed by Dream On. And be sure to join us Sunday morning, November 1, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern and Pacific Time for HBO's Countdown to Holyfield Bow. We'll take an in-depth look at both fighters and their respective camps as they prepare for that November 13 heavyweight championship fight. If you missed tomorrow's broadcast, you can watch it on Wednesday, November 4, at 7.30 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. On Friday night, November 13, DBKO presents live pay-per-view coverage of the World Heavyweight Championship between undisputed champion Evander Holyfield and number one contender Riddick Bowe. Be sure to call your local cable operator for details of how to see the fight. In case you tuned in late and missed the WBC Heavyweight title elimination fight between Razor Ruddock and Lennox Lewis, which we showed just a little earlier this evening, we'll be rebroadcasting that contest later tonight at 1 o'clock a.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. So now for Larry Merchant, George Foreman, and Harold Letterman, I'm Jim Lamplett, saying so long and happy Halloween from London, England. Well, that's it for Tales from the Ring. But remember, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, and when fight night is fight night, think of me. Happy Halloween! is Ross Greenberg. Tonight's coverage of World Championship Boxing was produced by Rick Bernstein and directed by Mark Payton. The associate producers were Kirby Bradley and Martin Marks. Feature producers Kendall Reed and Brian Brown. Assistants to the producer Dave Leapson, Adam Berger, and Artie Curry. The production manager was Russell Gabay. And the technical supervisor was George Wentz. Presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions.